Now I'd like to introduce our speaker today, an Ivy League scholar who is passionate about psychology and neuroscience. When I wrote that, I realized it could serve as the introduction for not only our honored commencement speaker, but also our valedictorian. Do we detect a theme? Today's speaker, Dr. Mary Helen Emerdino Yang, studies the psychological and neurological bases of social emotion, self-awareness, and culture, and their implications for learning, development, and schools. She is an associate professor of education at the Rossier School of Education, an associate professor of psychology at the Brain and Creativity Institute, and a member of the Neuroscience Graduate Program faculty at the University of Southern California. <laughs> Fight on. We have a, quite a number of our class of 2017 headed to USC. <laughs> a former public junior high school science teacher in urban South Boston, she earned her doctorate at Harvard University in 2005 and completed her postdoctoral training in 2008. Since then, she has received numerous local, national, and international awards for her research and her impact on education. Dr. Imardino Yang is a prolific scholar with dozens of published works, including peer-reviewed journal articles, book chapters, and books. Titles include Correlations Between Social Emotional Feelings and Anterior Insula Activity Are Independent from Visceral States But Influenced by Culture. <laughs> and my favorite, Rest is not idleness in the brain. Why kids may need downtime and opportunities for reflection to develop a strong sense of self and a moral compass. She recently published, isn't that great? Great title. That was our primary school faculty giving an extra cheer there. <laughs> they really get what kids need. She recently published her 2015 book, Emotions, Learning, and the Brain, Exploring the Educational Implications of Affective Neuroscience. In addition to scholarly publications, Dr. Imardino Yang has been featured in Scientific American and the Chronicle of Higher Education, on PBS Nova, and on NPR, National Public Radio. She has spoken at TEDx, to the Shoah Foundation, and today at Viewpoint School. Her route to academic life was circuitous, an encouraging model for our graduates. She has been a carpenter, a world traveler who studied new languages from Russian to Swahili to immerse herself in learning and culture, and who found her calling in the intersection of psychology and neuroscience, using research to solve the important societal problem of how we educate. Her work reveals that meaningful learning always has an emotional component, that complex emotions like admiration and inspiration are connected to learning and human survival, and she understands the importance of belonging for an emotionally healthy school. Every time I talk with her, I come away impressed with her whirlwind intellect, reflecting on a world of ideas, but importantly with a passion for her research subjects and a heart for children and young people. Please welcome Dr. Mary Helen Emerdino Yang. Thank you. It's quite an honor to be here today among all these distinguished graduates in such a wonderful school as Viewpoint. I always feel like I learn as much from coming here as I impart while I'm here. And as I was thinking about what I'd like to say today, I thought I would talk to the graduates and to their families and teachers about the power of emotion. For centuries, Western philosophers have strived to describe learned and educated people as those for whom emotion plays no role in their intellect, for whom emotions are suppressed in the service of clear-headed thinking, for whom rationality rules. Unfortunately, what we've learned from neuroscience and from psychology over about the past 20 years is that in fact, rationality is an inherently emotional thought process. It's impossible to have meaningful thought, to have morality, 
to have purposefulness, to have innovation without emotion. Even today, we strive to separate emotion from reason, to distance our subjective perceptions of situations from our decision making, and to sort of clear our minds of emotions so that our thoughts can be justified and clean. I, I know this may frighten you parents, I understand, because I myself am a, am a parent. But given everything we've learned about emotion and its power to steer the mind, I would urge you graduates to do the opposite. Aim not to distance yourself from your emotions, but to leverage your emotions as powerful motivators for change that you can wrought on the world. The source, yeah. The source of all inspiration, of all passion, and of everything that is meaningful is its emotional connection to the idea that undergirds. But not all emotions are created equal. They differ on important dimensions. And to use your emotions well, to use them mindfully, to use them morally and strategically for good in the world, you need to understand the difference between emotions. Some emotions propel you to act now. These are the emotions that keep you from falling off the edges of cliffs, that offer a hug to someone who looks sad and make you lash out at someone to whom you're annoyed or with whom you're annoyed. Those emotions are very important. They steer your behavior and they need active regulation to be able to be used in ways that are safe and that are kind. But other emotions don't pertain to acting now. And these are the emotions that I would adjure you to try to cultivate in yourselves as you move forward with your lives. These emotions are about the meaning you make of situations, the intentions that you infer about the meaning that undergirds people's actions, the emotional inferences you draw about why things happen as they do and how they could happen differently. These emotions are the stuff of values, of deep relationships, of cultural meaning making. These are the emotions of possible futures, imagined worlds, innovations, and of social justice. My advice to you, if I can be so bold as to offer some, is that you learn to feel these emotions and that everything you do and learn, you strive to put in their service. I understand there are engineers and artists and scientists and humanitarians and musicians and athletes among you. And that as you continue your scholarly and personal lives, your journeys are not simply to advance your fields and to move through the ranks of achievement in your discipline or your chosen endeavor. I would argue that it's to learn how to feel. <laughs> By that I mean feeling as a process, an effortful process, a painful sometimes process, an exhilarating sometimes process. I would advise you to work hard, to dig in, to experiment and take risks and submerge yourself in what life has to offer. And when life doesn't offer, construct it for yourselves and bring others with you. Through the power of the meaning you make of the actions that you undertake, and not simply through the power of the actions themselves, you can bring others with you so that the world becomes a better place for your having been there. Because what matters, what divides good from evil is how you feel. And I do not mean what you feel. I mean how. The process by which you evaluate and become aware, become conscious of your emotions and of the values and the desires that are driving your and other people's actions. It's a process of learning to notice, learning to recognize the circumstances that call for action even when those actions are not apparent at the surface. Learning to notice how your and others' actions impact others or could impact others 
if only you tried harder or more strategically. Learning to feel is the process by which your life and talents and skills take on meaning. In the neurology lab, we've discovered and watched amygdala light up when people react to circumstances, when people see things that cause them to have emotional reactions. And we've seen something else also, something that I would argue is infinitely more powerful to changing and sustaining the human condition, something that speaks profoundly to the power of emotion to heighten consciousness, to activate visceral somatosensation. Emotions that are to do not with direct actions, but with the values that undergird actions. Emotions like inspiration, like awe, like compassion, like admiration for virtue. These emotions get their power not from the amygdala, not from that little nucleus in your brain that fires to make you react in the moment, but instead from hijacking and repurposing the very same neurobiological systems that literally keep you alive. We see medulla activation. The medulla is at the bottom of the central nervous system just above the spinal cord as a part of the brain stem. We share the medulla with alligators. If you get damage in your medulla, we cannot even keep you alive on life support because your physiological homeostasis becomes completely dysregulated. You stop breathing, your heart stops beating, and you die very rapidly. And when people are moved and inspired by the values that undergird others' actions, we see activation in the medulla, consistent, strong activation in the part of one's brain that literally conjures consciousness that makes you more alive, more aware, more awake. Our physical survival and our social survival, I would argue, at this late stage in our human evolution are completely intertwined with one another. We are no longer just bodies. We are bodies with minds that conjure meaning. And it's in that process that we find the power of education. It means that only through learning to feel compassion, inspiration, awe, emotions, all of them that involve deep connection with other people and deep connection with powerful ideas. Only through finding these emotions can you fully live. And so my hope for you as you celebrate today with your families and your friends, and then as you step over the threshold of Viewpoint School, that you live your life in a place of deep social emotion, that you live your life like you mean it. Thank you.